Hello, this is Mary from Casing the Cover, and as library brats, my co-host Jen and I happen across numerous crappy covers, atrocious authors, sad titles, and the occasional masterpiece. We spend an unhealthy amount of time decoding how cover designs can be humorously contrary to the story within, and how publishers lure unsuspecting readers. Should you judge a book by the cover? Join Mary and Jen on the case to find out. Hello! Are you starting today? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hello! Welcome to another episode of Casing the Cover in Quarantine. <laughs> in Quarantine Edition. <laughs> these are going to be happening for a while, I feel, these in Quarantine Editions of the show. Yes. I I kind of do feel like as soon as you get your, your picture fixed, we should probably make these open to public consumption oh well that's not gonna happen anytime soon because i can't <laughs> get it fixed i have nowhere to take it and no money to spend on it so. oh sad yeah. we can't break it worse no exactly <laughs> it's not work at all i looked into getting um uh, uh what do you call it like a like a usb plug-in um webcam yeah. um they are all sold out everywhere because people need them to work from home so yeah, that didn't happen. And um, I think podcasts take lower priority than you know Zoom meetings for actual jobs. Lies, lies. We are an actual job. We just don't get paid. <laughs> we get paid in your love and respect and undying fandomness. This isn't even kind. This is like hobby at best at this point. <laughs> Okay, so talk about your book. Before I keep the book. Writing. All right. Okay, I'm gonna ask for the Mary opinion on it first, as I show you through the through our screen. So this is the Orange Grove. You said this is this is your Versailles book. This is our second uh, historical fiction podcast of the month. I, I'm kind of enjoying this. Um, yeah. So the gal on it, she's got your typical French um Marie Antoinette hairdo which I'm not sure is time period appropriate I don't know that much about French history I don't know if that's the right hair fashion for the era of the book you're reading it's pretty close it's okay it's accurate enough okay. um it seems a thing, little Marie Antoinette leaning it seems a little later period of France yeah but it it's it's good it works she looks like Emily Blunt. She does have a very modern makeup thing going on. Yeah, it, it looks, the, the eyebrows are very modern. So the other thing is, it's only half her face. It's a perfect book face book. It is. It's only half her face. It's a black cover, and she is all monochromatic blue. Yes. She's, it's she, it's kind it, of a gray blue, but yeah. 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 It, it looks like Emily Blunt. Uh, this feels to me like it's definitely a stock footage cover. But they tried to make it look like it's an interesting stock footage cover by doing the kind of blue tint to it. Yeah, I I think they did a decent job with yeah. this cover. Um, it's not the worst stock footage cover. It's it's definitely no, better than most. No, it it is. Cover images are by Shutterstock. Mm -hmm. So yes, I uh, I I like the flowers and I like all the stuff with it. I think the thing that gets me when I see this much detail in a cover um, in their in their style, in mm -hmm. what they're wearing, I look for those little details. And I did this with Avali's book too. I look for those little details. Oh, she's wearing a ring. Oh, she's got these flowers. Oh, she's got this thing in her hair. And I want that to mean something. Yeah. I want that to be like, oh, that that's the ring they talk about in the book. And that's the, well, no. <laughs> well, I guess that's the advantage of, we, when we talked to Avali, she did say that her cover artist actually poses models for his covers versus stock photo. If you yeah. have a model and you can dress your model and you can make them wear things that are relevant to the story and you dress like a cop because you are a cop and all that kind of stuff versus googling in you know going into shutterstock and going picture of cop or picture of french person in this case yes you, you can't really i mean you could probably photoshop in or out those details yeah and they didn't they, like you know. none of the details 
on this really hold a lot of meaning in the book. Yeah. And, and I'm going to say that the title doesn't even really, what's the, the title is the The orange Orange grove. Grove. The orange grove sounds like a, like an angsty modern drama. Yeah. There's a little of that going on in this. Is there? Um, okay. So I wouldn't have titled this book, the orange grove. The Orange Grove does not, to me, sound like it's historical fiction or that it's French. So there are some things that take place in the Orange Grove surrounding this Duke's Manor. Okay. But I think it would have been better to call it the the house that they're living in, where uh, it's... The Chateau of Duke Hugo d'Amboise. There's a lot of French names in this. Yeah. So it's probably good that you didn't read this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not good at pronouncing French things. I'm so not. Um, so maybe, you know, I, I don't know, like the trials of d'Amboise or something. Or I, I don't know. I just don't get why specifically the Orange Grove. There is one thing but it happens towards the end of the book and it's not a big lead up to Mm -hmm. it. It's sort of a random. And in fact, the whole concept that gets thrown in at the end of the book is like, what? Hmm. Really? And, and that happens in the orange grove, but it happens so late in the book that it doesn't feel like it's attached to the main storyline. It feels like an afterthought. So, okay, I'm going to read the back. In, in Blas, in, I actually pronounced that really badly, but anyway, uh, uh, in 1705, the Chateau of Duke Hugo d'Amboise simmers with rivalry and intrigue. Ooh. Henriette d'Augustine, one of the five mistresses of the Duke, lives at the Chateau with her daughter. When the Duke's wife, Duchess Charlotte, m- maliciously undermines a new mistress, mistress named Letitia. Yeah, I'm like, I just can't pronounce anything, English or French today. Uh, L- Letitia Hen- Henriette. Oh, hold on. Wow, that is really poorly written line. Anyway, Henriette is forced to choose between position and morality. She fights to maintain her status whilst in whilst targeted by the Duchess, who will do anything to harm her enemies. The arrival of charismatic tarot reader, Romain de Villiers, further escalates tensions as rivals in love and domestic politics strive for supremacy. In a society where status is a matter of life and death, Henriette must stay true to herself, her daughter, and her heart all the while hiding a painful secret of her own. <laughs> so from what I gathered from, from, from the summary, this, so, so our beef so far with this book is not the cover itself, but it's the title of the book. Which, the title of the book. Which we yes, were bound to run time. into eventually. Um, what is the genre of this book? Does it have a specific genre or is it just fiction? I, w- I would call it historical fiction and I don't know how else to say this. Like, it's like Mean Girls sort of. It's, it's, ish. it's like a historical drama. Yeah, it's historical drama. It's uh, historical soap what's opera. It? Historical soap opera. That's perfect. Okay. Yes, it's but a it's historical n- soap opera. It doesn't really lean into the romance element as much. It's not, not like really. a straight romance. So I think the problem with this book, what it seems like, based on what you read me as the as the Um, summary it feels like if they had named this book anything else it would have seemed like a romance novel because if you call it the duke's whatever or if you call it you know anything with a duke in the title sounds like a romance novel this is true also anything with french in the title sounds like a romance novel (laughs) yeah and maybe that's it maybe that's what it was about but like I mean, you could have just called it the name of the chateau, which I don't know if it actually says the name of the chateau in here. It, I read this book a couple weeks ago, and you know what happens when I 
I haven't read things in a while. The good things. There's a lot of different things here. I can't find the name of the room. I just it makes me wonder if maybe the the original title was something that sounded more like a romance novel title, and maybe the publisher was like, "Let's not use that." Yeah, because it really there is romance scenes in it. Yeah. So for those who are like, "Oh, I I don't want to read anything with romancy scenes in it," there are romancy scenes in it. I didn't feel like they uh, were the reason for the book. I mm-hmm. feel like they were more like, hey, look, here's another moment of intrigue right. built in to this situation. Because um, it really is about the intrigues. I also it, wonder, um, is the, because you say it's about the, the intrigues and stuff, I feel like a lot of, even in, within soap operas themselves, like the genre of television soap operas, a lot of like your really hyper dramatic really intense everyone scandalous things are named after like places or you know the ranch or the uh the there's a movie august osage county or versailles which is the tv show i was talking about last time or they're named after like even like old plays a lot of them would be like named after a place or a spot in the home where the drama happens i wonder if that's what they were going for yes they just picked the wrong spot okay that's fair (laughs) I don't get why they picked the orange grove. Okay. So I I am going to spoil this book. Go for it. It's going to happen. Uh but before that I'm I'm going to say that the the components of the book that make this historical are actually very powerful and I like it. Okay. I I do believe that this writer did her research. Oh, by the way, writer's name, Kate Murdoch. Okay. Uh, she, she's also a painter. So that's kind of cool. Uh, she's got a lot of short fiction out and she's from Australia. Oh, wow. So um, I really am impressed with her. She seems to really revel in the 1700s mm-hmm. of things. Uh, I, I could be totally wrong and this is like the first thing that she's ever written in this style but to me it really feels like she gets a thrill out of this time period she loves it she she wants to live in it she understands the romance of it and i know that you and i have also done from from the panel that we did about mean girls Mm -hmm. mean girls in history and and some of these things of like you know they're all trying to poison each other and they're all trying to kill each other. All the crazy going on. <laughs> and everybody's sleeping court. with everybody. Yeah. Yeah. It, this, this is an actual thing that, that happens and, and she likes it. She revels in it and she does it well. Mm-hmm. It's the storytelling part that kind of falls apart. <laughs> okay. Um, she wants to tell a million stories in a book this thick yeah and that's not how many pages is that like two something so i'm just gonna look now because i know you can see how skinny it is but it is a total of 245 pages this is not a thick book she wants a french soap opera written as a novella yes and like i almost feel like if she had taken each one of the ideas and released them as a novella and created like a series yeah and maybe named it, named the whole series after the chateau, Mm -hmm. and then said, this one is the Orange Grove. Yeah. About this part of the chateau. You know, it's chateau whatever, the Orange Grove. Chateau whatever, the boudoir, whatever. I don't know, but that would sound broke. Did you get the feeling reading this book that it is leading up to a series, or did it feel like it was a standalone stuff, got resolved, this is the end of the story? I, it definitely is a, this is resolved, because she rushed to the point of resolving everybody at the end. Oh. I mean, wrapped that sucker up, tied a big fat bow on it, and shoved it out the door. I, that's the biggest drawback I have on this book, is that as it was ramping up, it was like, okay, there's a lot about to go on here. Oh, I'm totally interrupting. Your screen is like beautiful right now. What is it? 
Yeah, you're you're Mary. After all, after all the sorry, I've had screen issues with my computer. I'm inter- you're interrupting your own. Uh, I want to see it, but I can't because it won't show me my own screen. <laughs> um, my my camera's been half so self view. Oh yeah, it was working. It's because I pushed it. Maybe I need to do that from now on. Um, I don't. You can't see, but I have a cat here, and I was afraid of her walking on the keyboard, so I shoved my computer back into the wall. <laughs> Well, it did magic. It <laughs> um, it's beautiful now. Okay, yeah, I apologize. Now. I totally took us off track because because that was magic. But look, I'm going to bring us back around. This book totally took everything off track by throwing in magic. <laughs> did it really? Yes. Uh, oh, my gosh. See? See, that was all a segue. Uh-huh. Really I'm good long at what I do. segue. Good at what I do. Anyway, <laughs> total professional. All right. So, the big event that happens in the Orange Grove is a sacrifice to the Dark God. Which seems like something that was happening around that time period in France. Yes. And I totally get that. But the only lead up to it was the fact that the main guy, one of the main guys, is a tarot reader. He's not involved in the spell at all. He doesn't know anything about it. He's been kicked out of the chateau by this point. Okay. So it felt like it was this bizarre side note (laughs) being attacked by a cat this bizarre side note that suddenly took over the whole concept and if after reading this book if you had opened with this big grand ritual and said and this is why all this shit went down Mm -hmm. I'm in you got me I buy but it happens at the end. And it really is a force to escalate everything to this point of like people just absolutely out now dying for stupid reasons. Um, so I, I just, I can't wrap my head around it because you could have done, you could have told this whole story without it. Mm -hmm. Um, because everything that happens subsequently after her ritual which the duchess does this big ritual because she hates everybody so much she just wants like I don't know everybody to die Uh, the all of this stuff could have happened anyway Uh, she was already like screwing with people's lives and attempting to murder people and doing all these things so it, it didn't was, really need the magic element yeah you didn't need this thing to happen i so i feel like it was a really weird tool to throw in okay the everybody gets their comeuppance in this book which is kind of cool and i think is very realistic to the world of of Versailles which they Mm -hmm. mention Versailles and they do visit Versailles and there are things that happen but 90% of this event of the events of the book happen at the chateau okay uh the the duke is basically sleeping with everybody he's got five mistresses that are all living in the house with him sounds about right which I'm like this sounds more like a harem than anything uh none of the mistresses are allowed to have people of their own and when he finds out about them he flips his shit uh the the tarot reader sleeping with the crazy duchess but he's also trying to make it with henriette who is like really a pretty cool person like out of all the characters i'd say that she's she doesn't feel like the main character when you're reading it even though it it says on the back she's the main character um 
she doesn't feel like it. Letitia, who is the youngest of the mistresses, the prettiest of the mistresses, mm -hmm. uh, she seems like the main character. So I keep trying to follow her. Okay. In the story. So like when I'm reading it, I feel like everything is going to lead back to Letitia. Everything's going to lead back to what happens to her. But it doesn't. It like takes a right turn and goes back to Henriette. Uh, then you think it's about Henriette's daughter, Solange. And uh, I'm like, okay, but, but Solange is nobody in this. Like, she's the most innocent creature out of all of it. She's the Duke's illegitimate daughter through Henriette. And she's just sort of like, this is my life. And, you know, she's like 13, 14, 15, something like that through the course of the book. And, and you just kind of feel like she's kind of pointless. Mm. Um, <laughs> this again so, sounds kind of like it's the, she was trying to tell too many stories at once. Yes. The, ultimately, like I said, the biggest problem that I had with this is that she was trying to tell too many stories at once and she's cutting from one story to the next. And it, it, it can be done where one seeds the next, but she didn't do it well. And I don't know if maybe she was supposed to write something that was a limited number of words. And this is how she had to put it together. Yeah, she just was like, I have too many stories to tell, but I have to hit, this is, has to be my max page count. So we're just going to cut entire chunks of story. And it it's just like, the moment I started to get like my teeth into a, into somebody's story, she popped into something else. She's got to have a huge headcanon for this. Yeah. Because from what you're saying, it sounds like she's super into like this time period. She probably has like an entire headcanon of this is the world I've created. But she yeah. felt like she had to scale that down and get it into 250 pages. And so I'm going to say this because I have been here. Yeah. I will definitely say that the first novel that I published, the the pirate novel, does this shit. Mm. And I have guilt about it. I'm not going back. Right. Um, it is what it is. And the lesson is learned. Don't don't try to cram that much crap into a skinny little book. Which is probably why you're more sensitive to it in this book. Yes, I think that that might have been what made me so sensitive to it is I'm like, I see my own mistake mm -hmm. in this book, uh, which is why I'm totally still giving it credit as like, it's, it's a good story. It's a good concept. I really, I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the characters. It just, it gave me a little slice, a little nibble of this banquet right. of stories. It's like, okay, but but I want to know more about Henriette and her crazy daughter who's in the convent. And I want to know more about what happens to the Duke. And I want to know where the heck Letitia comes from. And if she ends up happily ever after with this other guy, because that's kind of a thing that ultimately happens too, is that everybody kind of gets their little fairy tale ending. And except for, um, like, the Duchess, whose life absolutely goes to shit. But she's the villain. She's, yeah, but she's not even, I, I don't know, yes, she's the villain, but I didn't hate her enough to, like, even feel bad. Okay, well, she's the, okay, so what you're telling me is this is a book where all this passion and research for the time period went into this book to make yes. a soap opera about a period in time when everyone hated and was murdering each other. But then at the end, the antagonist gets their comeuppance and everyone else lives happily ever after. Yes. This, this sounds like publisher interference. Who is this published by? Uh, Regal? Yeah, Regal. Regal House. I don't know anything about the publisher. I, okay, I can tell you definitely that this, this is a smaller press. Yeah. It's in North Carolina. Um, it, this is a brand new book, essentially. It came out in 2019. 
uh, it's still like, I mean, we've been talking about the library being closed, but it's still got the sticker on the side that um, we got um, it at the library January, in January. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's, and you can tell that it's small press because of the, the size and the it's, texture it's of the book. Fat. Yeah, or it's a uh, wide. We talked about that. So it, it could be that it's small press and the and the publisher had a lot of um, naysaying about it. Yeah, this sounds it, like a book where they went, there's too much going on, get rid of half of this stuff, or either through, through editing or through publishing or something. It sounds like this person had a lot going on. Someone told them, cut it down. The ending needs to change. Yeah. That's what it sounds like. But on the flip side, it could be she's just really new at this Maybe. and didn't know how to appropriately approach yeah. so many stories at the same time. It really feels like a new writer. Yeah. Uh, which is why, again, I'm not going to like bag on it as a, as a story itself because I think she did a good job with what she offered. Um, and I would recommend this book to somebody who liked the time period and wanted something a little bit, I don't know, some candy to read. Right. Like, like I'm not going to read this and think I'm going to learn all this stuff. And I think a little easier. Yeah. It's just yeah. sort of like, you, you want some junk to escape into about Versailles. Here you go. Uh, that it does do. And as far as like the cover being that, the cover is exactly that. Look, we're yeah. Versailles, only not really. We're sort of a washed out version that, the, that should be on, you know, TV today. Mm -hmm. Like all, um, it reminds me of, there was a Marie Antoinette movie that came out. A little Christy at, Dunst. Yes. Where they put, where they put modern music in it. It looks like that. That's what this is. But again, that's why I that's why I said when you showed me the cover, it doesn't it seems like the gal on the front is a little too rococo. She's a little too modern. Yeah. Compared to the time period it seems to be set in. It looks like and, it's a little a little further down the historical context, like the publisher went and Googled French lady and put it on the cover. Yes. But what's cool about it is in this case, it's perfectly accurate. <laughs> you get what you get. This is the pop culture version of Versailles. Yeah. Oops. And I think there's a plane going over. See, I hear something in the background. That's not that's not fairies. <laughs> it's not fairies. It's an airplane. You got a cut um, on your nose, dummy dummy. Sorry, I've got a cat. Um so yes. The issue that I have with this cover and the lies that it is telling is it shouldn't be called the orange grove. It's it's the title. It's a stupid title. What's the I can see it on there but I can't read it. What is the blurb on it on the front cover? There's a blurb on it. Oh, a historically authentic and intelligently crafted period drama that's romantically stirring. Seems like a fair assessment. I I will give that it, it has historical authenticity. Yes. Um it is a period drama. It's a little bit romantic. Yeah, I, there are romantic. It is not a romance. There are romantic connections throughout this right. whole thing. Romantic elements of it. Um, but it's not about the sex. It's about the relationship. Right. And like I said, I wonder if it seems like the factors into that title are A, maybe the publisher had some interference. B, maybe it was, we're trying to get it away from sounding like it's a romance novel, so no royal titles can be in the in the title of the book, because that makes it sound like a romance. I almost also wonder if it was like, well, your book kind of has a lot of, a lot of strings, it has a lot of, you know, spider webbing plot lines. The climax happens here. We're going to make that the, the title of the book. Yeah, I guess. I think if you called it The Gardens... Yeah. Maybe the gardens or the chateau garden. You still, that doesn't sound romancy to me. And she's got flowers in her hair. Yeah. <laughs> and then it's like, oh, but you've got the thorns of these people, but the beauty of the romance too. Mm -hmm. So it's the garden. Which also uh, gives biblical connotations. 
which in a way yeah it does yeah. have a lot of that too because you you've got like this you know kind of Cain and Abel thing going on you got, you got there's a lot of intrigue mm -hmm. so I I could say you know the maybe just the chateau's groves or the grove uh the gardens the chateau gardens you fell out on the title no good <laughs> This is a case where you can you can judge the book by its cover, but not by its title. Yes, I mean I don't think we've had one of those yet, have we? Um, I don't think so. Not not to recollection. I mean, you get a lot of, and I feel like this is kind of um, a trend in naming both um, books and films to a degree. Less so, but I think you have a lot of trends where the more vague your title is, the better, because then you're not, if you make your title too specific, then you, this that's exactly what this problem is, is the title is too specific. It's referring to a very specific place in the book and not the book as a whole. Whereas yeah. if you pick a title that's very vague, either to the general problem of the book, the general location of the book, the general character of the book, you know, something like Romanoff, it's about the Romanovs. That's general right. enough. Something like um, The Pumpkin Man. It's the villain. That's general enough. The book, I didn't like that much, but the title told you what it's about. It's about a man with a pumpkin face. <laughs> you know, um, the chef is is vague enough that it's about a chef. Yeah. Past that, I mean, who knows? It's just about a chef. And you can think he's Gordon Ramsay because it's just called The Chef. When you try to make your, your title too specific, it either needs to be something that is very specific to like the metaphor yes or or to like a very specific like it's it's named after a specific character in the book because they are so important if you do something that specific it needs to be very very telling and impactful to what your book is about yeah i cannot think of an example <laughs> well and and again with this Maybe that's the stuff that got cut out of this book mm -hmm. because they do go to the orange grove. There are other times when they're in the orange grove, but I had so much trouble keeping track of who was the main character mm -hmm. that I couldn't. Okay. So every time a character was in the orange grove, my brain was going, okay, this is important because it's in the orange grove. But then it was a character that was kind of like, nah, not, they're not really the not that important. Yeah. And so it's like, I, I don't know. Like these, it was almost like, here's a vignette that doesn't mean anything mm -hmm. in the background of what you should be paying attention to. Is your Henriette, is Henriette or Henrietta? Henriette. Is she like the direct um, opposing force to your Duchess? No. She's like the... I don't know. Okay, this is what I mean. It's so frustrating. I'm trying to. I'm trying to decide why they tried to advertise this book as this character is the lead instead of just. And again, this sounds like what was decided by the publishing company to go. Okay, this is about this character instead of going. This is a story about the intrigue going on in a chateau in France between yes. the Duchess and her husband's mistresses. It went. This is your lead character, and this is what she's doing. Yeah, but yet Henriette is the character from beginning to end. Okay. She is in there from beginning to end. Letitia seems like kind of a tertiary character. I swear there were a couple characters that came in that I'm like, where did you come from? I don't even remember them introducing you. And all of a sudden I'm, you're talking about yourself like I should know who you are. And that got me. I don't know. The the tarot reader seemed important and then he wasn't and he tried like he used to be the lover to the duchess before she was the duchess but then he ends up with Henriette so I guess to some degree the duchess and Henriette become in solid opposition yeah. if you talk about this one thing and this dude but, yeah, it just, it, it's a bunch of threads 
that never really wove together into anything. Yeah, it sounds like if it was a case of, hey, you've got a lot of story here, but you need to cut it down so it's more manageable instead of cutting out. It was. It sounds like she didn't want to kill any of her darlings. So instead, she just didn't finish any of their stories until the end. And then she's like, and they're fine. Yeah. And Rather it, than it, cut characters and cut plots, she went, oh, I can do a little bit of everything. And I, I don't know, maybe maybe that's why it's called the orange brew, but she didn't prune anything. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's this it's an orchard of of stories, but it's just growing wild. I it's don't know, man. All the darlings running amok. It and you know, I gotta yeah, I didn't think about this when we first started talking about this book. But it really is starting to get to the point where this is this is my mistakes from my first book. Yeah. I, and it's funny that I see them all because that was my mistakes. I, I had way too many characters with way too many stories and a whole bunch of crazy stuff going on with all of them. And at the end, it's just like, ta-da! <laughs> and, <laughs> and it was pretty bad. Um <laughs> I shouldn't be shit talking my own book. Not shit talking. You're reflecting. I am reflecting. And in fact, I'm reflecting very much in the same way I'm reflecting on this one. The characters were interesting. It was very amusing to read. It's got no guts, but it's a lot of fun. And okay. if you like the time period, you can tell the research was done. And I swear to God, I could say that about my own book. And that's really weird. The, the setting <laughs> is there. And the characters are there. They just don't necessarily um, work in a way that is comprehensive from beginning to end. Yeah, it's it's a bunch of little crazy stories that happen. Um, and Again, I guess like a soap opera. Yeah, it is. It's like a soap opera. And I think the I will reconcile on for my book on my behalf. It is a story told about a bunch of sailors that are pretty much drunk ninety percent of the time. So in that way. <laughs> It fits. Your narrator's <laughs> unreliable because she's wasted. She's totally wasted. So it's okay. And in this one, I don't know, maybe the narrator's unreliable because she's rich and stupid. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. But, but I really did like all the characters in this. I, I, in fact, that's, that to me is the, is the drawback to it is the negative i i enjoyed these characters give me more so so there you go that was a fun little trip into versailles um i would recommend it but change the freaking title <laughs> <laughs> that's that's all i got <laughs> well very good very good. It seems like you do okay. you enjoyed it okay. I did. It was, you know, sometimes you just gotta have something that's an escapist. Do you sort of have thing. any other recommendations for people who maybe enjoy this time period and or maybe recommendations for things that do the lots of character arcs a little better? Um, lots of character arcs a little better. I, I really don't, I can't think of one offhand. So maybe at some point I'll leave a comment on this and say, this is a good one. Yeah, like maybe does, like, as an example for people who maybe are, from like a writer's perspective, and now that you have also written something similar and now are looking back on seeing what you did wrong, maybe something that balances its characters well that you would recommend to people who are running into this problem of, I don't want to kill my darlings, there's too many people, there's too many stories. That oh, as... To other writers who haven't published something like this. Um, this is not a two readers thing. This is two writers. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Like as an example of like how how balancing characters can be done well. I, I would say if you're very new at writing. Or if you are a lazy writer when it comes to learning from your mistakes. Stick to the rule of five main characters, five primary characters, and 
just ride with that. Mm -hmm. Don't go beyond that. If you go with multiple characters, oh, what am I doing saying that I don't know one that can't follow multiple characters? Duh, freaking Game of Thrones. Good example. It's an excellent example. But here's, and want to know why I came up with that example? Here, because the next thing I was going, the next piece of advice, if you can't stick with those five characters, be prepared to write freaking a shit ton about all these characters. Or, or on the other side of that as a Game of Thrones example, if you don't want to focus on a main character, be prepared to kill them at the end of the first book. Yes, yes. Be prepared to kill them. But also, like, if you've got a oodles of characters with oodles of stories and so many things you want to tell, be prepared. Your book is not going to be this skinny. It's going to be gigantic and several volumes. And accept that. There it is. I think it's also important to note that, you know, just because you have interesting characters, and I'm a person who, when I read a book or even when I watch a show, my favorite characters are always the side characters. And maybe it's because. A, I tend to feel like people who get leads are get leads in like shows because they're well-known actors and not necessarily because they're the best people for the part, whereas side characters tend to be the best people for the part and they're interesting. But also even yeah. like when reading Harry Potter growing up, my favorite characters were always the characters you didn't get enough of. My favorite character was not Harry Potter. My favorite character was not Hermione. My favorite character was not Draco Malfoy. My favorite character was Remus. My favorite character was McGonagall. My favorite characters were... And these side characters, so you really just come in to do their part, and they're good when they do their part, and then they walk off. You don't need to have the entire life story for every single character in your book. You can yes. have characters who are just good side characters. And, and they don't, you don't need to see the end of their story necessarily. Yeah. Like, you can leave that up to the reader to fill in that gap of, like, well, gee, I saw them kind of walk into the sunset this way. And so this must happen. You don't have to tell it. At mm -hmm. the same time, like, if you do have a main character, we, we want their story to come to a nice, neat ending, mm -hmm. but don't rush it. Well, like, and, and your side characters can have their own story arcs. They can have character development Mm -hmm. But it doesn't need to be something that spans seven books. No. I mean, I mean, I, I'm not going to use the books as an example because I haven't read all of the books. But look at Lord of the Rings. Oh, yeah. You, know, you have characters in Lord of the Rings who have story arcs. The movies, at least. In the books, they don't flesh them out as much. Um, but, you know, your main character is arguably... Um, Frodo but he's not really the protagonist um the one who kind of has the arc the the hero is is Sam Sam probably has the biggest arc in the book and in the story and then Aragorn has his own arc and then Legolas and Gimli are cool but they don't need to be there that much no no you know you and you could love them and they can be your favorite character and maybe they are um but they don't need to have all the intrigue and all the things. They don't have to have a love triangle Hobbit movies. And, you know, they can just exist and be there and do the cool thing. They don't have yeah. to have all of all of the extra coding. Yeah, that's and that's the biggest part with this book. And with, I think we've read a couple other ones too where it's like well, there was no point to having that character in there. Yeah. But, and, and I will that's say worse. Yeah, I will say that I'm with you on really loving secondary characters and discovering lately that in my own writing, I like my own secondary characters a lot better, which is a really weird thing to find out. I feel like maybe it's easier to like secondary characters because when you have a protagonist, when you have a main character, and again, I'll use Harry Potter as a good example, because, you know, Harry is your main character. He has to go through trials and tribulations. He has to be flawed and he has to you know go through these things and make decisions and sometimes when you're in a character's head that much you don't like the decisions that they make and yes. you don't like it when they have to be flawed i mean what's the base criticism of the fifth harry potter book is all harry does is whine the whole book because he's a teenager and you're stuck in his head for an entire 
seven thousand page novel, yeah, it's boring and he's angsty and obnoxious. Whereas Luna, who just kind of floats in and is fun and is cute and then goes away, is a lot easier to like in that book than Harry is when all he does is angst of the whole book. Yeah. So it's also sometimes easier to like side characters because they don't have to be as flawed. They don't have to struggle as much. They're a little easier to enjoy than your lead sometimes. Yes. Yes. I can see that too. Yeah. I don't know. But I think this was, uh, as we wrap up talking about the uh, delving into historical fiction. Yeah. Your book kind of took an idea and went a little sideways with it Mm -hmm. and added the magic which is kind of funny this one added the magic for a reason but it did a really good job at saying kind of almost newspaper reporting ish in the way that it's like this is how it was Mm -hmm. these people were bad to each other right (laughs) they were really shitty to each other so I, I feel like with yours, it was tell the story and add the element. This was, this is the element. Right. The Just, I'm telling you how bad these people were to each other. And that's a story in and of itself. Yeah. Um, and she did that well. She did that well. Um, but it was a little bit more like reading a bunch of textbook cases, different dossiers of these people and their crappy drama maybe maybe it should have like maybe it started as like a collection of short stories and she tried to make them have a plot together maybe i don't know kate murdoch if you hear this by some weird chance and you want to tell us about your book i'm totally down to talk to you about it because like i'm interested to see what your thought process was on this and and we'll be nice i promise I tried to be nice with this. I think, you know, you gave it an awesome shot, college try, and it was... (laughs) I'm just curious to, I I wonder how much of that was restrictive by her publisher. Yeah. And and that doesn't necessarily need to mean that they went in and rewrote her book. It could just be, hey, we're not going to publish a 400-page book. Because when you think about it, if you're not George R.R. Martin, if you're not J.K. Rowling, publishers don't want to publish a a book that is as big as a house. They don't. They don't want to have to produce something that's 600 pages long unless they know that people will buy a book that's 600 pages long. And that usually means you have to be Stephen King or you have to be George R. R. Martin or you have to be, even in, even in, in your genre, you know, you have to be Brandon Sanderson in the fantasy market. You have to be Robert Jordan. You have to be someone that you know that book will get picked up and read yeah. If you're a new author, they're not going to let you have a 600 page book. They're going to let you have a 300 page book. Yeah. And that's, and again, for 300, less than 300 pages of fluff reading material to, that actually did kind of get me through the beginning portion of this quarantine madness. Mm-hmm. It was really valuable. <laughs> it's good Florentine, uh, Florentine, <laughs> quarantine fluff. <laughs> Florentine. It is, it's quarantine. Fluffy quarantine. <laughs> fluffy quarantine work it's escapism yeah. so there you go that's all i got on that one all right i i think uh i think i would read another one of her books if it popped up somewhere so we'll, we'll, worth it we'll find Absolutely. her website maybe you can maybe you can scour and see if there's more stuff on there to read all right <laughs> all right i think that just about wraps it up we've been talking for a little while here yeah, I don't even know. I, I don't keep track. It, it doesn't like tell it. us how long, when we do it this way, it doesn't tell us how long we've been recording. <laughs> Does it? It's somewhere? Nowhere? No, it now doesn't. Now curious. <laughs> it doesn't tell us until I export it, but that's okay. Oh, well, that's a thing then. I don't know. But, cool. Yay! All right. Um, until next time, this, is, this has been the end of our uh, historical fiction month. Yay! I don't know what this is going to be going out in May. Yes. Um, and next next month we're talking about movies. Which were all recorded pre-quarantine. Yes, they were. <laughs> I've been putting notes in the in the show notes of this was pre- recorded pre-quarantine, this was not. So that it's a little less, it won't be any less confusing. But that's what we're talking about next month is we're switching things up a little bit. 
And instead of looking at book covers, we're looking at movie posters because, you know, June is usually when blockbusters come out. Not this year. <laughs> oh my gosh. We did it. We cursed it. Oh my uh, God. That's okay. We caused this, Mary. It's our fault. Since you we shouldn't have done out. the dark mass in the orange grove. <laughs> Since you can't go out and watch <laughs> blockbusters, you'll have to listen to us talk about weird movies instead. <laughs> That's a consolation prize. <laughs> All right. Well, until uh, until next time, goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you so much for cracking another case with Mary and Jen. To learn more about Casing the Cover, follow us on Facebook and Twitter at Casing the Cover. To contact us or suggest a book, email casingthecoverpod at gmail.com. New episodes of Casing the Cover release the second and fourth Tuesday on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher.